Another factor that may have contributed to Jimmy Moran's behavior on the night of the crime, and that we didn't have time to cover in the broadcast, was his drug use, chronicled at his trial by drug counselor Renita Jane. I met Jimmy Moran when he was 17 and a half years old. It was September, and I met him because Hope Brown had contacted me that her daughter had a new boyfriend, and she was concerned and worried that Jimmy might be involved with drugs. He admitted to me that he was a user, but not consistent. Just so that we're clear, he was being treated for his abuse of what drug? Cocaine. At Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island, we met with a cocaine addict from the real world, here for a study of his brain. So you, you really, you understand the world of, of addiction. You've seen people addicted in that kind of thing. What, yeah, what, but see, with cocaine, it's a different kind of addiction because it's, it's not a physical addiction. Like, you don't get sick if you don't have it. Mm. You just get to the point that it becomes a choice. It's what you want to do. Mm. When you start down that road, you just, that's what you end up wanting to do. When you say, well, should I go to a ball game? Should I go see a concert? Should I go to a family gathering? You decide, well, I'd rather do the cocaine instead. So to stop going down that road, you got to stop it before it starts. You got to catch people when they're young because then it just becomes a way of life. Why cocaine is so addictive, why Paul would love to escape its pull but can't, is a question that has long fascinated neuroscientist Nora Volkov. 30 years ago, you started? Yes, and it was at a time when the imaging technologies were just emerging. And uh, it occurred to me that uh, unique applications was to use them to study the brain of people that were addicted to drugs because to start with, there's always been this belief, and they're still there, that people are taking drugs just out of moral failure because they want to have a good time, and they are just not able to say no, yeah. without recognizing that indeed, that there are changes in the brain as a result of repeated drug use or genetics that makes these people literally lose control. Right, and so, right. So they, it's not a question of choice. It's not that they just decide to do it and won't stop deciding to do it, right? Well, the concept of choice, I mean, one of the, the issues that people don't think about is when you're doing choice, you're actually, there's a brain structure and brain circuits that allow you to determine, make a, a judgment and then make a decision. I'm not going to do it. Mm. But, but that requires that the areas of the brain that inhibit that's desire to do something work properly. It's literally like when you're driving a car, you may want to stop, but you require the brakes to function ah, yeah. in order to be able to stop. And there's a part of the brain that works as the brakes that is not always at work when you're in the throes of drug addiction, right? Exactly, and that is, that's what's so fascinating and so difficult to understand about drug addiction, that the areas of the brain that are normally allow you to say, even though I want to do this very much, I'm not going to do it because it's not a good idea, and you are able to restrain yourself, that area of the brain is affected by the repeated use of drugs. Paul Flora is being prepped for a scan of his brain using a technique called PET. Okay, just a little pinch. Do it okay? I'm doing just fine. Great. It involves his being injected with a radioactive tracer attached to a drug that mimics the effects of cocaine. When Nora Folkoff's team here at Brookhaven first did experiments like this, they used actual cocaine labeled with a radioactive tag. There you go. One of the beauties of this is you can make it in tracer quantities. So you make it in the quantity you'd give a person would be like a couple of micrograms. You and that's not enough to get them high? No, it takes 40 milligrams, so it's tens of thousands of times less of a dose. I see. So you can actually track where it goes and how long it stays without a pharmacological effect. And then got approval for human studies right, and went through right. all of this, this I would stuff. imagine it would be very difficult. It to... was difficult because when we went through the approval process, it was interesting the difference between micrograms and milligrams, took, it, it took was a it, lot of explaining. I don't know why, why it took so much. I mean, you're giving cocaine, yeah, but it's just, you know, it's just a minuscule amount. In the PET scanner, Paul is being positioned so that the detectors around his head will be able to spot exactly where in his brain the drug is going 
how quickly it gets there, and how quickly it is cleared out. In those early studies with cocaine, the surprise was just how quickly cocaine both came and went, peaking in just a couple of minutes and gone within 30. So we think this study that we did early on with Nora taught us a lot about what, the way people take cocaine. They take it, they get, they get high, the high leaves in about a half an hour. They remember the high, so they take it again, and so that's like the binging that people oh, use when they, when they take cocaine. So the fact that it leaves so rapidly right. means that right. they take more of it right. more right. frequently. They take it, they take it until either it's gone or they're exhausted. The PET scans also revealed that cocaine stimulates the receptors in the brain that normally respond to dopamine, and that repeated use of cocaine reduces the number of dopamine receptors. At the same time, the activity of the brain's executive control area, the prefrontal cortex, is also depressed in drug users. Does this depressed uh, functioning of the prefrontal cortex, where all the control is coming from, is that does that happen in tandem with the increased use of the drug? Is it's, it somehow a product uh, of the use of the drug? You know, since we don't have scans before, we can't tell for sure. But it's in proportion. So the, the person with the lowest dopamine receptors will also have the lowest metabolism in the frontal cortex. So cocaine not only produces a highly addictive instant high, it may also suppress the prefrontal cortex's ability to just say no. Okay, I'm going to put that in for you. The new study Paul's a part of is tracking not the effect of cocaine itself, but the effect of simply seeing cues associated with the drug. These alone are enough to stimulate dopamine release in his brain. His brain is anticipating the pleasure of the drug even before he takes it, though in Paul's case the craving is still tempered by the thinking part of his brain. When you were watching the movie, Paul, yeah. did, did, uh, did you feel anything, were you aware of a feeling of um, wanting a drug? You know, it would probably affect some people like that, but when I see other people doing it, I actually feel ashamed. Mm. You know, it has, um, I guess, a reverse effect on me. That's interesting. Yeah, it's like you don't really want to see it, because you, know you know it's wrong. You could argue that Jimmy Moran chose the path that led him to that horrific act of violence. But to the extent that drugs played a role in leading him there, Nora Folkoff wonders how many choices he actually had. You have to realize that more, most of the experimentation occurs when you're a teenager, when you have the pressure of your peers, and you are in an environment that doesn't have the knowledge that we have, as adult, nor is your brain connected the way ours is. Yeah. So is that really self-control when an adolescent is surrounded by their peers, their par their, his or her parents have paid no attention, they are half depressed? In an environment like that, is that really self-control? Mm -hmm. Is that really free choice, free will? Yeah. Because it, it draws to that element about yeah. what free will is. Free will is when you have choices, right? Yeah. Because free will without choices. <laughs> It's not so free. There's no. It's not. If there's no choice, you just do it. You just do it. Yeah. And so, so even at that very fundamental uh, concept of experimenting with drugs, where the person is not addicted, you have that element that the experimentation occurs within a certain context. Yeah. And and it's also to me, I like to discuss this because it uh, one of the things that I've been very frustrated as a physician and not, as a researcher on the field is the lack of empathy for the person that's addicted to drugs. And it's empathy that allows us to actually reach and help others. And yet, in drug addiction, that is not something that we generate. It's actually the opposite. We yeah. want to punish, just what you were saying. Punish, you get impatient. Correct. And, and I do not know of any disease that destroys families the way that drugs of abuse destroy families. Yeah. I mean, situations where, where pa a parent can tell a ch uh, their son or daughter, I'd rather have you dead mm. than like this. I mean, that is not something that happens with other diseases. So it's very devastating, and it does reflect in a part the, the inability of generating empathy on a person that's addicted, that suffers a, very, a pretty devastating disease. But that unfortunately, because of the nature of the pathology, 
is affecting the way that we relate to others. Well, that's the problem. That's why I, I would imagine parents have the impatient, judgmental position that they take, which because unlike a disease where you lay there in bed sick and moan, yeah. and, and, and in a way it activates our desire to help, this has a social component where you lie, you disrespect, you ignore, you pay no attention to advice. You, in fact, you do the opposite because you've got to have it. You have to have the draw. Yeah. yeah.